I'm Peter Fitzgerald, and I'm what the kids today call an old show queen. Among other classic movie genres, I love the women's picture. In this series, I'm looking at the careers of classic film leading ladies, with an eye on reigniting the genre. Because we need more movies with women in the lead role today. We all know kick-ass women. So why aren't we getting a chance to see their stories on the big screen? Let's face it, the number of movies with male leading roles far exceeds the ones with females. And I think it speaks to the value that we put on women in life, as well as in the movies. Misogyny clearly plays a huge role in the Hollywood gender gap. And it also speaks to the rampant homophobia civilization is just starting to recover from. We live in a time when masculine traits are far more culturally dominant, as reflected in the movies where we're seeing women act a lot more like he-men. I have no idea if or when the pendulum will swing back and women's films will flourish again, but it's important to remember how and why they did. So here we go. Believe it or not, the woman's film was once a huge industry with a massive audience worldwide. These weren't just lifetime movies or soap operas. Many were adaptations of popular novels of their time, and some were period epics, with heroines that were as complex as they were extraordinary. Let's take, for example, the string of hit films starring Greta Garbo. Here is a prime example of a major studio putting its vast resources behind a woman's film franchise that was not only hugely profitable, but also incredibly wonderful. Now, Miss Greta started out as a silent film vamp at Hollywood's biggest studio, MGM. It was here that she made the transition to sound in the studio's hit woman's talkie, Anna Christie. Give me a whiskey, ginger ale on the side. And don't be stingy, baby. Anna Christie is the story of a woman who reconciles her years as a prostitute with her estranged father while trying to start a new life with her sailor boyfriend. Here, she pulls you into the movie with a strong message about female independence. Nobody owns me, see, excepting myself. I'll do what I please, and no man. I don't give a darn who he is can tell me what to do. But I know what you're thinking. I am my own boss. The movie was a big, big hit, earning $1.85 million. And if you consider that ticket prices were around 20 cents a pop, that's a lot of butts in seats. MGM's Irving Thalberg went about developing a franchise of women's films for Lady G, Inspiration, and Susan Lennox for Rise and Fall with a hot young Clark Gable. The two stars did not get along, which may prove the two tops don't make a bottom. However, Susan Lennox became Garbo and Gable's first top 10 grossing talkie. Then she played the infamous World War I spy Mata Hari who slinks her way into the arms of the enemy in order to extract their secrets. Of course, fate takes a hand, and they eventually march Matahari off to the firing squad as she goes quietly mad. And it's fabulous. Now there's a remake opportunity, Charlize. Matahari was the fourth top grossing film of 1931, and one of Garbo's most profitable. Garbo appeared in an all-star ensemble drama, Grand Hotel, which became one of the blockbusters of 1932. Here she plays Gruzinskaya, the independent, spirited prima ballerina, one who never really dances, by the way. It's been said that women and gays loved Garbo for all of her glamour, intellect, and insistence on being in charge of her own fate. Here's that famous line that would mirror her personal life. I want to be alone. G-Spot wanted privacy for a very good reason. History has borne out that Garbo preferred the company of women. Garbo kept her gayness under wraps because, hello, 1930s. But it was this mystique that fueled the audience's fascination for peeking into Garbo's on-screen psyche. Grand Hotel made Garbo a household name on the level of Oprah. And to strengthen her case, she carried another film, As You Desire Me, that was another top-grossing hit of the same year. 
The Garbo craze was at a fever pitch, and MGM doubled down with a publicity campaign that could rival anything today for her next movie, Queen Christina. Here's a classic woman's film story form, that of a heroine choosing between her job, in this case, queen, and romance. Her love scene with John Gilbert is absolute proof of Garbo's silent film skills. Now, some could argue that abdication for love is a dated theme, but hello. In the end, tragedy ensues and Tina loses everything. So she sails off into an uncertain future, retaining only her beloved independence. Also fabulous. Tina is La Greta's butchous performance, and it speaks to Hollywood's lopsided homophobia. Now, if a man is outwardly gay on screen, he is out because the patriarchy. But when a woman shows masculine traits, it's respected. Go figure. Queen Christina became the third top grossing film of the year, and Garbo became the highest paid actor at MGM. The studio gave the Gigi brand a huge buildup for her next role, Anna Karenina, and mounted the film in the grandest possible manner. Uplands. Here, the female protagonist, isn't it great to hear that, the female protagonist, encounters tragic reversals when she chooses the love of a dashing man in uniform over her duties as a wife and mother. After everything goes sideways, Anna Kay makes the ultimate sacrifice, and audiences showed up in droves, and of course left with wet hankies. Anna Karenina proves that if executed properly, Tragedy can be an enormous draw. When the boys club can't relate to something, in this case, Garbo's eccentricities, they poked fun at her in cartoons that spoofed her demeanor and big feet. Oh. Which wasn't really accurate. Garbo's career reached its zenith in 1936 when she starred in Camille. And this time the stakes are more complex and tragic than ever. With the great gay director George Cukor at the helm, La Greta soars as Marguerite Gautier, an indulgent, consumptive prostitute, basically, who falls in love with gorgeous Robert Taylor as Armand Duval. And how long do you expect this thing to last? In spite of her love for Armand, Camille chooses to spurn him at the request of his father in order to save him from the cruel fate of their life together. I can pay you for this. I'm not worth killing, Armand. I've loved you as much as I could love. If that wasn't enough, I'm not to blame. Spoiler alert, she nails one of the greatest death scenes of all time. Perhaps it's better if I live in your heart where the world can't see me. The film was a massive hit with audiences, particularly among women and, according to my elders, gay men. Camille was Garbo's highest achievement and was the fifth top earner of 1936. Though she lost the Oscar to Louise Reiner playing an Asian. Okay, Oscars. So where do you go after you reach the mountaintop? For Garbo, it was a nice long vacay in Sweden because the girls gotta reduce. Greta Garbo returned to Hollywood in a swarm of publicity for 1939's Ninochka. Here is a woman's comedy where the female protagonist has to choose between her job as a cold-blooded Russian envoy and the love of a madcap playboy. This film illustrates the conflict between one's head and one's heart. Just when her dour character is the breaking point, Garbo laughs. <laughs> Nanashka falls in love as only the repressed can. She gets drunk and bravely asserts her credo. People of the world, the revolution is on the march. I know bumps will fall, civilization will crumble, but not yet, please. Wait, what's the hurry? Give us our moment. Let's be happy. By the last reel, Ninochka leaves Russia for the promise of a new life of unlimited possibilities. In 1939, 
the movie was number 11 at the box office. A fitting climax for the leading lady who spearheaded one of the most profitable and wonderful women's film franchises of the 1930s. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more in the series, you might consider supporting my efforts on my Patreon page, and you'll receive a credit on my future videos. Thanks for watching.